Hi, everybody. It's Peter Schiff. It is Monday, June 10th, 2013. On Friday, we got the highly anticipated non-farm payrolls number for May. Now, I had expected the number to come out below estimates. In fact, the consensus seemed to be uh, by the time Friday morning rolled around that the number would miss the estimates. I was basing my idea, and so was everybody else, I think, on the fact that most of the other economic data, contrary to how the media had been reporting it, but most of the other data had in fact been negative. And so it seemed like the stage was set uh, for yet another negative economic data point. The markets were surprised by the fact that the number beat uh, those rather diminished expectations. The estimate was for 165,000 jobs to be created, and there was 175,000 jobs. The markets reacted positively. Uh, the Dow Jones ended up up about 200 points by the end of the day. Uh, the media spin in general was that it was positive economic news uh, that lifted the stock market. In fact, I think the main reason the stock market rallied, other than breathing a sigh of relief, that the data wasn't even worse. After all, when you lower expectations, it's not that hard to exceed uh, the reduced estimates. But I think the real reason the market rallied was because the data was not strong enough uh, to cause the Fed uh, to taper back from its quantitative easing. In fact, 175,000 jobs created is not a strong number, not at all, especially when you look beneath the surface, which generally, you know, the devil is in the details when it comes to these job reports. First of all, they revised down the last two months by about 12,000. So if you take that into account, we didn't really beat the estimates. We pretty much uh, you know, came in right in line with estimates. In fact, it's my opinion that when next month rolls around, they're gonna revise this month downward. So I don't know how many jobs we created in the month of May. We might find out that we missed estimates after all, but by then the market will now be focusing on the June number. But again, if you look at the details, we actually lost 8,000 manufacturing jobs in May. That's the third consecutive month where we lost manufacturing jobs. We lost 9,000 the month before. The jobs that we are creating are concentrated in the service sector. Uh, I think it was leisure and hospitality, hotels. Uh, that's where number one was. You got restaurants, retail services. Remember here, you have a lot of companies that have to hire more part-time workers because they're laying off some of their full-time workers uh, because of Obamacare. And the jobs that we're destroying, the goods producing jobs, help us export. They're higher paying jobs. We're replacing those jobs with lower paying uh, goods consuming jobs that actually worsen the, the trade deficit. Also, the unemployment rate actually notched up. It went from 7.5% to 7.6%. The labor force participation rate did pick up a notch, I think to 63.4 uh, from 63.3. So we did have some more people entering the labor force. They were Many of them were not able to find jobs. So the unemployment rate went up. Now, the unemployment rate going up, that is not an environment where the Fed is going to want to taper. After all, they have already set a benchmark of an unemployment rate of six and a half. We're now going in the wrong direction. Maybe this is the start of a trend. But if you listen to all the reports in the media, this was a great jobs report. No, it wasn't. It wasn't as awful as some people had been expecting, but it wasn't good. And it doesn't mean the Fed is going to step away uh, from its money printing, its quantitative easing. Of course, that's what it should do because that monetary policy is preventing a legitimate recovery where we, where we have sustainable uh, jobs that actually produce stuff that we need. We're not going to get a real recovery as long as the Fed is in there stimulating, but there is no indication that it's going to stop. I think the interesting action, though, was in the currency markets and in the bond market. The dollar failed to rally at all uh, on this news. In fact, the dollar had fallen sharply the day before, I think it went down about a four month low against the euro, and it barely gained any of those losses back on 
on Friday. If this really was a strong report, you would have expected a rise in the dollar, especially given the big drop in the dollar the day before. That didn't happen. But also the bond market. The bond market continued to sell off. In fact, the bond market is now making 52-week lows. As I'm speaking, yields have risen to a one-year high. So even though the data came out in such a way that should have been friendly to the bond market, especially considering that the bond market had already sold off so much in the prior weeks, you might have expected the bond market to rally on an economic data point that would show that the Fed was not about uh, to stop buying bonds, but instead the bond market sold off more. So to me, this could be the beginning of something much bigger, uh, the, the bursting of the bond bubble. In fact, I, I read an article today from Bloomberg in which they were trying to, uh, you know, look, they were looking at the bond market kind of as a puzzle because they were, they were saying that the bond market is falling, interest rates are rising, despite the fact that there's no inflation, and they were trying to look back in history to find out the last time that interest rates were rising when there was no inflation. Now, I, you know, I kind of laugh because how do they know there's no inflation? Why? Because the CPI says there's no inflation? You know, when I've been talking for years about the fact that government measures of inflation are inaccurate, people that criticize me will often point to the bond market. And they'll say, well, Peter Schiff, you know, he thinks there's no inflation, but the bond, but he thinks there's inflation, but the bond market is showing no inflation. After all, yields are really low. Now, I would always counter by talking about all the manipulation in the bond market, all the government buying that is distorting it. But nevertheless, uh, they would take refuge in low interest rates to prove that I was wrong and that there really wasn't any inflation. Well, now that interest rates are rising, they don't want to say, well, maybe there's some inflation. Maybe the bond market, is, bond market is sensing inflation, and that's why rates are rising. They're trying to think of, they're trying to make excuses. They're saying, well, the bond market is falling and rates are rising even though there's no inflation. Well, what, what is it? You can't have you know, your cake and eat it too. If you're going to claim that low interest rates prove there's no inflation, then if interest rates are rising, you have to concede that maybe it's because so are inflation expectations. And what I think the bond market may be saying is they're not afraid of the Fed tapering off QE. What the bond market fears is that they don't taper, that they keep on printing money to buy bonds because that's what's going to generate the inflation that erodes away the value of the bond market. And in fact, if the dollar is weakening, that would be for the same reason. It's not that the economy is strengthening, but that the strength is artificial coming from money printing and therefore it's destructive to the real economy and the value of the dollar. That's why we're seeing both the, the dollar and the bond market fall in tandem. The question is, when might the stock market roll over uh, and, and, and start to be bothered by what's happening in the bond market? Because if you look at the charts now, uh, we are very close to a real breakdown uh, in the bond market. I mean, we just need to move up a little bit more. I'd say on the 10-year, we need to get north of 2.4. Right now, we're about 2.2, a little over 2.2. But we're very close uh, to that key level, which could mean a much bigger move up in interest rates. Maybe we can get yields on the 10-year up around 35 to 4%. If that happens, and then the 30-year yields get up to about 4.5%, and mortgage yields go to 5%, you know, mortgage yields are now back above 4% for the first time in a year. Just a month ago or three weeks ago, uh, the 30-year fix was down at three and a quarter. Uh, that's a big difference. But if we go to four and a half on the 30-year, we could be looking at a 5% 30-year fix. Now, that might not sound like a high rate uh, historically. In fact, if you go back to the housing bubble, uh, the one that burst in 2008, the, 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 law, the yields on our 30-year mortgages didn't even get below 6% not on a fixed 30-year. Uh, so even at 5%, you would have a 30-year fix lower than it was at any point during the housing bubble, but it's still much higher than it's been. And one of the reasons that individuals have been able to buy houses at all has been the fact that interest rates are at record lows. Now, I know most of the buying or a lot of the buying is coming from hedge funds and private equity guys, so they don't care about mortgage rates because they're not taking on mortgages. They're borrowing money uh, from another source but the end buyer to whom a lot of these hedge funds are hoping to unload their properties, they need to be able to get a mortgage. And the more expensive that money is, 
uh, the less they can afford to pay for their house. So we'll see how much longer the, the stock market can ignore the prospect of rising interest rates and the prospect that interest rates are not rising because the market uh, is worried about the Fed tapering. Because I think the economic data shows that they're not going to do that. In fact, I think there was one Fed official that was out there saying that he thought that we needed 200,000 jobs a month created for four consecutive months as proof that the stimulus was working. I don't know if we've had one month of 200,000 jobs uh, during the Obama uh, uh, term. I mean, then maybe there was, uh, but certainly we were four in a row. We're not even close to that. So I think that some, there's something else going on in the bond market other than worrying about the Fed pulling back. Because what is the Fed going to do if interest rates really start to move up? If the bond market breaks down and yields start to rise the way I described, what's the Fed going to do? Is the Fed going to do nothing and allow uh, the recovery to, you know, to reverse? Because that's what would happen with rising rates. Or are they going to increase the size of their monthly QE? Because $85 billion a month isn't enough. If a lot of the private money that's in bonds right now tries to exit because they'd rather be in the stock market or because they fear inflation, whatever the reason is, $85 billion a month isn't going to be enough to stop the market from falling. The Fed is going to have to up the size of its monthly QE. But when it does that, uh, it exposes itself. It lets people know uh, the predicament it's in. It loses a lot of credibility if the Fed immediately has to print more money because just talking about maybe tapering at some point in the future causes interest rates to rise and that forces the Fed to now be easing when it's promising to tighten. Although, you know, tapering isn't even tightening. If they're talking about taking your monthly QE down from $85 billion to $75 billion or $65 billion, it's, you're still having expansionary monetary policy. The Fed's balance sheet is still growing. You're still adding to it. You, know, you, you haven't actually started an exit strategy yet because an exit strategy means the Fed has to sell the bonds it's been buying. But if the Fed ends up having to buy even more because simply talking about buying fewer bonds sends interest rates to a level that the economy can't withstand, then that exposes the flawed nature of the recovery. And I think that the Fed uh, risks a, even more damage, even because it talked about potentially tightening, but then is, refer, then is forced to reverse in response to what the market is doing. In fact, you know, talking about a reversal, I just read a story today that Standard & Poor's, and they're the one rating agency, or the one major rating agency, I should say, that downgraded U.S. Treasury debt from AAA to AA+. Well, today, they revised upward their outlook uh, for U.S. debt from negative to neutral. When it had a negative outlook, it meant that the Fed, that the next move was likely to be another downgrade to a lower notch. Now that they have revised that to neutral, they're telling the markets that they don't think that they're going to have to do another downgrade. Maybe the next thing they'll do is come out and upgrade again to positive and maybe get the credit rating back up to a triple A. The question is, why is S&P doing this? Because as far as I can tell, all of the fundamentals that caused the original downgrade have gotten worse. The U.S. government has more debt now than it did then. And interest rates are now rising, making that debt more expensive to finance. We've also done nothing about all of the structural problems that S&P noted when they originally downgraded. We haven't had any entitlement reform. Uh, you know, we have huge deficits as far as the eye can see with no way uh, to finance them. The only thing right now keeping us afloat is the fact that interest rates are extremely low, but interest rates are already in the process of rising. So if S&P was negative about the U.S. Treasury when they initially downgraded, they should be even more negative now. Yet now they're upgrading their outlook. Could it be that the lawsuit that the Justice Department filed against S&P for fraud uh, for their role in the mortgage crisis, even though Moody's wasn't charged, even though Fitch wasn't charged, they did the exact same thing as S&P. 
The only thing they didn't do is downgrade the U.S. Treasury. Is it possible that maybe that lawsuit kind of helped get their mind right? We'll see. I mean, I'm thinking that maybe now that they're playing ball, maybe the government might actually drop this lawsuit. Maybe it's going to go away. Maybe this is some kind of a quid pro quo. We'll find out uh, what happens. Uh, But at this point, as far as I'm concerned, although I think we reached this point a long time ago, what they say is irrelevant. And the interesting thing is they upgraded today and the Treasury market didn't rise. It fell. Interest rates rose again, again, hitting new 52-week highs, despite the fact that S&P, you know, with its arm being twisted behind its back, uh, you know, revised upward their, their credit, their, their credit rating. But anyway, keep watching the bond market. Keep watching the currency markets. Gold was down 30 bucks on Friday in response to the, you know, to the strong rally in the stock market and all this talk about a recovery. But I don't care how you want to spin it. The data is still weak. The recovery is simply in the eye of the beholder. It's in the eye of the stock investor uh, or the real estate speculator. The media wants so much. Wall Street wants so much to have a recovery. It's almost like, you know, if we build it, if we, it will come. You know, if we just get the stock market going up, if we just get the real estate market going up, then we're going to have a recovery. It doesn't work that way. They've got the economic cart uh, before the horse. But maybe, just may, maybe, the bond market vigilantes are waking up. They're coming out of their coma. We're starting to see a reversal in the bond market, a reversal in the dollar. And, and, and that's going to turn this whole thing upside down. It's going to upset the, the apple cart. And this story is going to begin to unravel. So keep, uh, keep, uh, keep a lookout for that key data, interest rates and the dollar. And watch gold and keep uh, tuning into the shift report. And again, if you want the day-to-day updates. Don't forget about my radio show. I do it every week, uh, every every weekday rather, from 10 a.m. to noon. Shiftradio.com is the website. Bye for now.